Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, Margaret and I are thrilled that you're here, and it's the second annual Joint Grand Rounds. Many years ago, Margaret and I talked about lots of opportunities to really engage together around um, leadership development, research, evidence-based practice, and this is a culmination of some of those ideas that we talked about um, when I interviewed Margaret for Dean. Um, and so I'm delighted that the day is here. Um, I just want to say how thrilled we are uh, with having Donahue and what an influence she has had on so many of us over the years, many, many staff in the Yale New Haven Hospital Organization have either been her students, um, have been mentored by Donna, or in some way influenced by her experience with research, with policy, with advanced practice, and clearly with nursing itself. I actually will be doing the interview um, on behalf of Diane Vorio, who was called away for the day, she is sorely, sorely disappointed that she is not here to participate in this work. And I will read her words. Um, so if I look like I am reading from this document, I am. <laughs> um, so I was practicing before I came over with her words and where the phrases might be. So uh, if I stumble, I apologize to Donna, but she's so good with this, she'll pick it up as we go. Just one correction on your agenda. At 340 to 350, it says the Virginia Henderson Award. Indeed, it is not the Virginia Henderson Award, it is the Donna Deers Awards. So that is a typo. So without further ado from me, I'll turn it over to the Dean. Thank you, Sue. I have two great pleasures this afternoon. The first is to add my welcome to Sue's to this annual Joint Nursing Grand Rounds. Um, last year, we um, heard Angela Baron McBride be interviewed by Donna. So tables now turn. Donna gets to be the interviewee or interview. E, yes, as opposed to the interviewer. Um, I, I do want to say, uh, Sue kind of alluded to the fact that um, this is one of many collaborations between Yale New Haven Hospital and the School of Nursing, this being a major one, but also we had the opportunity this past year to write a grant together. It didn't get funded, but it was, but you know, 80% of all grants don't get funded. Uh, but in any case, the opportunity to work together with the staff that Sue put together and a team of people from around the state around the education of advanced practice nurses, nursing was really a wonderful collaboration. And then there are many others involving um, research at various levels and others. And so we feel very privileged to be a partner in many of these endeavors. Um, today's master class is likely to provide each one of us with new perspectives on nursing and leadership. The second delight I have this afternoon is to introduce my colleague, my mentor, my friend, um, Donna Deers. Um, Donna is a graduate of the University of Wyoming, Yale University School of Nursing, and the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. She is identified with the emergence of clinical nursing research methodologies, having written the first tech book, textbook on that subject, Research in Nursing Practice, two copies of which remain in my office. <laughs> she is also recognized for her work in, in, on the policy and politics of advanced practice nursing. Her work with DRG-based information for hospital data systems begun in Australia and carried out for many years here at Yale New Haven um, has informed clinical, operational, and financial decision making not only in Australia and here at Yale New Haven, but across the United States. 
She was Dean of the Yale University School of Nursing from 1972 to 1985. I note that I was a student then. Donna taught me my first ever research course. And that turned out reasonably well. <laughs> Uh, her publications have appeared in all major nursing journals in the United States and in many journals in health services and nursing across the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Focusing on helping nurses to use information technology and administrative data to enhance nursing services. She was editor of what was then called IMAGE, now called the Journal of Nursing Scholarship, for eight years and continues to serve as a manuscript reviewer for a number of professional journals. A pop, popular public speaker, she also consults and teaches on writing for publication. Her book, Speaking of Nursing, Narratives of Practice, Research Policy, and the Profession, essays from her, um, her thoughts over the years, um, won the AJN Book of the Year Award in, in 2005. In 2010, she was named a living legend by the American Academy of Nursing, and this past spring, she received an honorary doctorate from the University of Wyoming. It is my honor to introduce this wise woman, cherished mentor, and devoted nurse for today's master class, Donna Deer. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. You can hear me. Okay. As Margaret said, last year at this time, uh, we had as our guest here Angela Baron McBride, another renowned leader. And Donna actually was the interviewer um, of uh, Angela and referred to her new work. Uh, many of us uh, have since purchased it The Growth and Development of Nurse Leaders. And it was indeed memorable. I went online just before I came over and Googled it. It's on YouTube. So um, I was reminded of how fine an event and instructional it was for all of us, um, as well as fun. And what a good interviewer Don it was at that time. So here we go. Now, um, I am honored uh, to be here. Uh, she's been a role model for so many of us, myself included. And, you know, as a young student, I too used that research book. And I was very excited to come to this organization and meet the Donna Deer. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, Donna's had a, a strong influence on Yale New Haven Hospital. I remember coming and listening to her talk about data and about some of the work that she had done with our patient service managers at the time around their master's projects, really looking at data and looking at the complexity of nursing units and really focusing at the level of that unit-based data to determine the complexity in the mix of patients. She has been a leader in the develop uh, development of what we call the uh, nursing data office in this organization, I think it was a key to our magnet work. And actually, her writing skills came to the fore when we went through that magnet journey. Donna got stuck interviewing me for transformational leadership, trying to figure out how do we bring that chapter together. She kept coming back and saying, is this what you meant? Um, so here we go. So we're focusing on the book called Speaking for Nursing a narrative practice, research, policy, and the profession. Linda Aiken, the Claire Fagan Leadership Professor of Nursing, describes this book as a must read for nursing's leaders and for those who are interested in understanding more about the uniqueness of nursing. What moved you to write this book? Well, I'm sorry we're focusing on it because it's out of print. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I had the extraordinary opportunity while I was a visiting professor in Australia, in Sydney, at the University of Technology, Sydney, to uh, become aware of and then to participate in a particularly, uh, or a particular um, doctoral program 
there is an option in Australia, as there is in many European countries and in New Zealand, for uh, what they call a, a, a PhD by publication which meant that I needed to take my publications and make some kind of sense of them. And that's a whole lot harder than you would think it would be, especially if they cover like 40 years. Um, so I did that and I had some really wonderful um, dissertation advisors, Professor Judith Donahue and Professor Jackie Crisp, both of whom occupy positions that we would call joint appointments here. There, they are appointments uh, focused on developing research in whatever institution they're in. Jackie was at Sydney Kids Hospital. Judith was at St. George. And they were just wonderful. They could not have been more supportive, more helpful. I mean, by then, I was old. <laughs> <laughs> and and kind of thought I knew what I was doing and nobody was going to tell me what to do. Well, uh, they did and they were very gracious about it and so I produced a, the manuscript on time. You have to do these things in a year. And then it gets sent out uh, to a group of uh, people that are selected by the committee and by uh, the candidate. And one of the people who reviewed it was Linda Aiken. Another one, is, one was Alan, what is your last name? Alan something, who was uh, the very first uh, professor of nursing in Australia. And the third was a, a woman who had been head of the major nursing organization, um, Judy Lumby. And then as the candidates, you sit around and wait. <laughs> uh, and they approved the thing. And so I went out there and um, did the graduation ceremony, which was wonderful fun because the graduation gown that you wear at UTS is scarlet. <laughs> and it has a, a, a white satin sailor collar. And it's really quite elegant. And it has the very best hat in the world. Graduation hats are uniformly terrible. This one is really, really good. And uh, <laughs> I was happy about that. But when I came back um, <laughs> home, and read my dissertation again, it was very pedantic. It was, it, it had to be, it was a dissertation, that's what they are. And I thought, um, I've s had other things to say about some of these matters uh, that haven't ever been published because I gave a lot of speeches uh, uh, over the years. And I thought, well, I wonder if I can make something out of the unpublished speeches um, over the years, and so I, I developed them into the four themes that are in the book, which are essentially the same four themes that are in the dissertation, minus one, I switched one around. I, um, and I made a proposal to the publisher, and the publisher liked it, and so I wrote it. Now, it was already written, you understand, so this is the easiest possible way to do a book, friends. <laughs> If you have given a lot of speeches and you have had the, the foresight to write them down, then uh, you're, you're in good shape. So I added some stuff, I deleted some stuff, I wrote uh, second thoughts to each one of the sections, and I picked some other things that were never actually speeches, but were things that I wish somebody had asked me to talk about, and uh, put it together in a book, and I was astonished at how well it went. Um, it was published in 2004, so it's eight years old and copyrights run out in seven. That's why it's um, uh, not for print anymore. Um, and I got all kinds of nice feedback from people. Uh, one of the things I did in the book that was uh, surely unusual for me, but unusual apparently in the way these kind of books happen, is I wrote a fair bit about myself personally and my family and um, where I was at the point in time where one of the chapters happened, one of the speeches happened. And I got more feedback on that than I ever got on the serious content. <laughs> <laughs> um, so be it. Um, I think I'll stop there and you can go on to your next. <laughs> I will. I'll try. 
or if I you want me to, I was I was looking to chapter two here. Well, I can elaborate one thing because right. I don't think it's probably going to come up naturally in this conversation. Um, I in the in the intro to the thing I wrote a little piece about being from Wyoming and I am from Wyoming and as a matter of fact I'm going to move back to Wyoming in not far distant future to the same town that I grew up in. It was a wonderful place to grow up. Wyoming is very independent. It's actually when I went to Australia I realized that one of the things that made me fall totally in love with it on the first trip was that it's a lot like Wyoming. Uh, it's bold and it's brash and it's colorful and it's beautiful. Um, but the story behind the story, which isn't in the book, is why Wyoming? And the story there is about two strong women, my grandmothers. One of my grandmothers, uh, who was a Welch woman, her name was Mazo Carey Gortney Dears, <laughs> poor woman, um, <laughs> was uh, had tuberculosis shortly after she and my grandfather married. Well, the, their children were like five, six, seven. And the thing you did with TB in those days, they, were, they lived in Nebraska, was to move to the mountains. And it happened that the town that they moved to, the town I'm going back to, is at the foothills of the nearest mountains. And that's why she ended up there. And eventually worked in a dry goods store. And uh, my grandfather worked a, a number of jobs. He was trained as an accountant. I don't think I've ever told Steve Allegretto that. I mustn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my other grandmother, Ella Myrtle, uh, and then she had two husbands, so she has two different last names. She was also from Nebraska. And she uh, married at 17 after following her uh, husband-to-be, who was a uh, minor league baseball player around on the circuit. She was a groupie. <laughs> if you ever knew my grandmother in her older years where she was a staunch Methodist lady, you would never believe that, but it's a true story. <laughs> her husband, the baseball player, unfortunately died in the flu epidemic in 1918 and left her with uh, two small children. My mother, who's the oldest, and my, and my late uncle. Um, and she needed to do something. And it was the beginning of the Depression. It was not a good time altogether. But her uh, sister and her husband, and the sister's husband, had located a place in uh, southwestern Wyoming, which is truly the armpit of the universe. It's a town <laughs> called Wamsutter, and it needs to disappear. It's just <laughs> not a good place. And uh, her sister, Ida, um, invited her to come out and homestead with them on the prairies and with the rattlesnakes. And so she did. And in the homesteading game, you got a, a shack, a tar paper shack, essentially. Uh, you did whatever you did to provide yourself with a bathroom. And my mother recalled and was fond of telling me that she and my uh, uncle would carry rakes to school to fend off the rattlesnakes. She was not able to prove up, which is what they called it then, on the homestead meeting to improve the property so much so that it would become her own. Um, and she uh, took a job as a waitress in the, in the cafe that served the railroad that came through Wamsetter. Nothing else came through Wamsetter. And she met there her second husband, Ray Ball, who uh, was a, worked on the railroad. And he married her, and they had two more children, such that my aunt, who is the youngest of the four of them, is only six years older than I am. So she's an almost sister. And her daughter is an almost sister. And we have an interesting little trio there. They moved to Sheridan, the same town that my um, uh, uh, other grandmother had moved to. And eventually, my mother, and uh, uh, her, <laughs> my father, um, met and fell in love and married. And you would think that with such a nice sort of connection there in a small town, the two grandparents, meaning my grandfather, my father's father, and the grandmother, my mother's mother, would get together. 
they were both widows. Uh -uh. <laughs> they called each other Mr. Dears and Mrs. Ball to the end of their lives. They were simply two different, different people. My grandfather was very Teutonic. He was very tall, he was six foot eight, and he had acromegaly, he had a big undershot jaw. Uh, my grandmother was actually very tall too, and had they ever danced, but she was Methodist, you understand. You don't <laughs> dance, uh, they would have looked quite good together. Um, but it was kind of a local story that Mr. Dears and Mrs. Ball kind of never got cotton to each other, as it were. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep, I gotta fix this whole thing now. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sue. Did right. I embarrass you? <laughs> all right, all right. We're gonna go back to my notes. All right. In the foreword, Diana Mason states that Donna Deers has thrown the mantle of leadership out to all nurses that we may follow her lead in thinking about, advocating for, and speaking of nursing in all of its glorious complexity. At the end of the foreword, she notes that public speaking as a leader is not always easy and certainly has not been easy for her, meaning yourself. She then quotes Donna, I think of myself as actually quite quiet, timid, and chicken, but with the responsibility to use a leadership position or a role in the service of advancing nursing, I morph into a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Tell us about those times. Can you give us some examples of when you morphed into a Tyrannosaurus Rex? And what advice might you have for the rest of us when we're timid, quiet, and or chicken? Find a cause. Next question. <laughs> No, seriously, <laughs> I discovered early on that I'm really not a very good nurse clinically. I'm just not, it's just not in me. <laughs> but I find nursing remarkably fascinating. And so over the years, without particularly planning it this way, I've taken up nursing's cause in various uh, venues. Um, The public speaking thing um, did actually scare me uh, uh, witless when I was young and hadn't done a lot of it. You get better over time or with the wonders of modern chemistry. <laughs> 25 milligrams of Inderol work really good. <laughs> But I, I remember one of the first great big speeches I ever did, and I had this wonderful outfit. It was a, a two-piece uh, white knit dress. White is the operative word here. And I was, uh, this was somewhere in Kansas, and I was on the second floor of a motel, and the meeting rooms were on a, a lower level. And I got to the top of the stairs to go down to the meeting rooms, and my knees were shaking so bad I couldn't walk down those stairs without falling all the way. And I thought, oh God, I'm going to have to sit down and, you know, do the thing. <laughs> um, so I walked around, uh, knowing that I was fairly visible in this white dress, and found a back stair and was able to, without anybody watching, get down the stairs. But it, uh, it was awful in those um, early days. Uh, you learn after a while to how to deal with an audience. You learn that from teaching, actually. Um, but you learn how to deal with an audience. And, um, and after a while, after having adopted nursing as a cause, then, and having done a couple of <coughs> uh, iterations of troublemaking speeches, you get asked to do more iter iterations of troublemaking spe speeches because nursing is so complicated and it's so uh, controversial to people out there. It's not controversial to us. We know what it is. We know what we're doing. We think it's, by and large, pretty good. But there are a lot of people out there who are stuck in 1928 visions of nursing. And I, that was my cause. I was going to try to fix that, among other things. 
um, <clears throat> turning into Tyrannosaurus rex. The first, I've done it a number of times. <laughs> um, including once here, quite famously, but we won't go there. Um, one time I, I do remember is I was uh, asked at the last minute to cover for a woman named Inge, Ingeborg Mausch, who was uh, a distinguished nursing leader and uh, was working with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on what was then called primary care nursing. And Inga was uh, supposed to be the keynote speaker at their at the Johnson Foundation's annual conference on primary care. And she could not do it because she was on the board of the Holocaust Museum, she being a Holocaust survivor in Washington, and they were opening the museum that weekend, so she couldn't do it. And she called me and asked me to do this, and I thought, oh, come on, me? And then I thought, hmm. <laughs> and so I did it, and the paper, is published, it's in the AJN in, I don't know, 19 something or other. <laughs> but seated in front of me were a whole lot of distinguished people, including Claire Fagan, Linda Aiken, who was then working for the Johnson Foundation as their senior clinical uh, person, and the whole staff of the Johnson Foundation, who at the time were all physicians and all very physician oriented. And many of us in nursing were very unhappy with the Johnson Foundation in those years because they were dedicated to throwing money at physicians and couldn't see nurses altogether. And so in the middle of this speech, I essentially said, you do realize, of course, that primary care is and always has been nursing. And you could have heard a pin drop and Linda Aiken remembers that to this day, and she twits me about it from time to time. So does Claire. But it's true. We were the first people to be out there in the neighborhoods, walking across the roofs in Manhattan to deliver primary care to the um, immigrant population. Nurse midwives have been there forever. And primary care has visiting nursing and uh, related efforts, now there's a lot of them, has always been nursing. And by and large, I didn't say it then, but by and large, physicians aren't really very interested in the first contact um, patients who are unselected and sick. And sorting that out is really not kind of what they like to do. So um, I think that speech, to the extent it got out, and it did get out through the publication, uh, began to turn the dialogue, maybe, in advanced practice nursing. Um, because to take on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in public was sort of brave, I suppose. I didn't care, what did I have to lose? <laughs> we'd uh, we'd uh, applied to the Johnson Foundation for money and been turned down many, many times. <laughs> so, it wasn't gonna ruin me there. <laughs> well. Given what you just said, um, where do you think it's going to go? Where do you think nursing is going to go? What are the possibilities? Oh, the Given possibilities are totally endless. Absolutely and completely endless. We can go any place we want to go so long as we are educated uh, and free to do it. And I think the uh, IOM report that came out now two years ago is a uh, perfect roadmap for how to do that. It has, because the IOM report was not written by nurses, the committee was chaired by, a co-chaired by a nurse, but the committee itself was made up of a lot of other people besides nurses. And so what it challenged us to do is to fix some of our eternal problems, especially our nursing education ladder, which isn't. And it uh, nailed head on the problems that advanced practice nurses have uh, moving from state to state because the laws are so screwed up, state to state. And it, it gave us a place to go. So that's, that's one uh, bit of evidence for where I think nursing is going. The other bit is I'm just now totally fascinated by what's appearing in the nursing journals in quality and safety, especially in quality and safety, and in operations management. And 
I, sorry, Margaret, but not so much in research. Um, some, some of it, yes, uh, but my interest has shifted away from clinical nursing research to um, systems research, operations, and so on. You people are doing the most amazing stuff out there. And it comes out of your understanding of practice. And by that, I mean not only how to take care of patients. You are <laughs> wonderfully trained in how to do that and how to manage the equipment. And I see Marie out there. She took me to her SICU one day, and they were decanting a patient from the operating room. And she had at least seven tubes in her hand. God knows what else that she was attached to. And I thought, ooh, not me. <laughs> Um, you people do astonishing work clinically, but what, where you really do astonishing work is in understanding how things work. And that's operations. You understand how a nursing unit works. You understand how to manage obstreperous physicians if you need to. You understand how to manage patients whose families speak no English and who are Romani gypsies. It's just amazing stuff. And nobody knows about it but us. And so toward the end of my career here, I'm trying to figure out how to make nursing more visible to the lay community who is everybody but us. And so that means the media, it means newspapers, it means television. I actually like Nurse Jackie, by the way. <laughs> um, and so I've begun to make some connections with, uh, there's a professional organization of healthcare journalists, and uh, Diana Mason is part of that group, and, and uh, we're plotting <laughs> uh, things that could be done with that group because healthcare journalists don't understand nursing altogether, as you well know from reading the newspapers. Actually, one of the people who understands nursing the best is Atul Gawande, the physician, the surgeon from Mass General, or Deaconess, that whole thing up there, partners. Um, uh, and the uh, prolific New Yorker writer, he, un he gets it, or he gets most of it. He's got a wonderful essay out there about uh, following a, a home care hospice nurse around and understanding in a way he had never understood before what that work was like and why it mattered. You've ruined every question on me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't well, know maybe it's time to turn to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. I found a couple others in here. Um, interesting that you answered most of what Diane had on this um, pieces of paper um, as questions. The last one was talk about why publish. <laughs> oh. <laughs> why fun. write about nursing? Um, and clearly, um, you answered that well. But there are two last questions that she has here, and I'm gonna read them. One is, vision doesn't necessarily make a leader, but a leader without a vision isn't. Lots written on leadership and today about heroes. What leaders have inspired you and who are your heroes? Well, I've had so many opportunities to have working relationships and friendships and sponsorships of extraordinary nurses. At the, there's no top. I, I don't want to name the top 10 or the top 20 or the top 49. Among the people that I value or have valued because they aren't all with us anymore are Ingeborg Mausch, is an extraordinary woman whose, particularly, whose particular capacity, I always thought, fueled by her Holocaust survivorship, was to always keep the humanity of the issue, whatever it was we were dealing with, at the center. We weren't just about making decisions, we were about making the right decision. Rosella Schlotfeld, who was a long-term dean of the uh, Case Western Reserve School of Nursing in Cleveland, took me under her wing when I was a brand new dean. She invited me into her house, and for one evening, she showed me what she does in the evening. You're better at this, Margaret, than she was. 
but she read her mail and she went through it with me piece by piece. This one I will do this with, this one I will do this with, this one I'm gonna throw away, this one, ooh, this one's trouble, and here's what I'm thinking about it. And she warned me about the things that she thought were the hardest that she had ever had to deal with as a dean. And the very hardest was having a student who was raped, as she did, and eventually as I did. And yeah, it's hard. Edith Patton Lewis, who none of you will have heard of, was the uh, long-term editor, actually, of all of the three big AJN company um, uh, journals, AJN, Nursing Outlook, and Nursing Research. She was a wild woman, a wild character. She'd come to nursing through the Geffen kind of a, a route. She'd been a college graduate from Smith, and then uh, went into nursing at Columbia, which had the only program at the time. And she was very, very fond of words, as am I, and so we had great conversation. She also smoked like a chimney, which eventually killed her, but not until she was 94. <laughs> <laughs> she was a remarkable woman, and she taught me particularly the value of being an activist editor. That is, one of the things that's really fun about being an editor is that you you get to see the manuscripts before they're published, so you get to see what people are thinking out there. And with a little clever uh, positioning of articles and stuff like that, you can foster something. Um, and we did that at Image on a, a couple of times. She also taught me how to write editorials. Editorial writing is a, a craft that you simply have to learn. You have to have one and only one idea, you, it has to be crisp, and it has to be pithy. And I know nobody in nursing who is writing those kind of editors anymore, editorials anymore. I tried to perfect that when I was editor of Image, and I got a lot of feedback that I did. I also got fired by Sigma Theta Tau. But that, <laughs> <laughs> um, others, Linda Aiken is truly astonishing. Her, she has many, many gifts as a researcher. But what she's really, really good at is making the connection between her research, which has all to do with nursing resources and patient outcomes, making the connection between that and the policy issues that are relevant right now. And somebody just sent me today uh, her very newest article, which is in Health Services Research, where she and her team have looked at mortality uh, in uh, cardiac surgery patients, no, it's in AAA, AAA patients, which are cardiac surgery patients. Um, and she finds that uh, increased nursing staffing predicts lower mortality, but that staffing up in a poorly organized or managed hospital does not improve mortality. And that distinction is going to be really, really important as we move forward. Um, I have any number of, of other people. Um, Robert Leonard, who is not a nurse, but was uh, very important to me when I first graduated from the master's program at Yale and began to teach. I took over his course, having just taken his course. Uh, he, by the way, is in Las Vegas this weekend. I had a, an email from him at the World Poker Championship. <laughs> <laughs> and he's quite good at that. Uh, there are so many uh, people who have influenced me as friends, as uh, colleagues, as sponsors, as people who give you a push and you know, shove you out the door and say, go, go for it. As a matter of fact, uh, Mike Loftus has done that several times to me when I worked in the hospital. <laughs> Donna, you go do it. To Steve Allegretto. Um, I would be remiss by trying to name others because there's so many and I don't want to leave anybody out. So go to your next question, please. <laughs> well, I've actually heard you respond to this, but elaborate a bit. The question is, knowing what I know now, would I do it again? In a New York minute. <laughs> I fell into nursing 
just because I fell into nursing. Um, the person who inspired me was the mother of uh, some friends of mine who lived up the street in this little town in Wyoming. And she was the supervisor of the, at the little hospital, which is still there, 88 beds. And she always wore white and wore the cap and wore the white stockings and wore the shoes. And she was just magnificent. And now I'm talking about the 1940s and 50s, where the big disease that we worried about in Sheridan, Wyoming in the summer was polio. They shut down the local swimming pool. Their you know, friends were being stricken, including my be very best friend, Beth, who came down with polio. And Georgia, the nurse, nursed them. And when she would come home from her shift in the afternoon, the first thing she did before she went in the house was take off her uniform and hang it on the clothesline. And that, that conveyed something to me about professionalism. Other than that, had I not been a nurse, I would have been a journalist because I do so love to write. But I'm too timid, I'm too shy to be the kind of journalist that I'd like to be, that is to say an investigative journalist. I can't get in your face and say, did you really pass that information along to the Soviets? <laughs> And what I have found in nursing is a way to put those two together. And it's been absolutely the, the thing to do for me. Nursing has fit me, not as a clinical nurse. Don't ask me to nurse you clinically. It would be very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but as a, a group of people to hang out with, as a group of issues to work on, God, the issues in nursing are so interesting. Yes, I would do it over again. And as a matter of fact, I wish I could, because knowing what I know now, <laughs> I would do it better and faster and more efficiently. And perhaps things would move a little faster. But I have realized that I have done what I can. I will continue to do what I can. I will continue to write for sure. And I'm extraordinarily satisfied with the career I've had. I've had opportunities that are just incredible to travel, to get to know people in different disciplines, to find nursing is very much the same from country to country to country. The issues are the same. It's just that these people figured out a way to do it and these people haven't. The, oh, I was drifting off there with a, a little international story that I don't really have to tell. Um, <laughs> it's nursing, if you want to take advantage of it, gives you an opportunity to do all kinds of interesting things from volunteering in Botswana as a, a alumna of the School of Nursing has recently done with her husband. Um, she did not volunteer as a nurse because she's not licensed in Bot Botswana but she volunteered as a health education teacher. And her husband, who is a psychiatrist, couldn't practice that either, but he volunteered as something else. I've forgotten exactly what it was. Um, and uh, she was just written up in the Yale Alumni Magazine, she and her husband, for, for this effort, uh, which they took. They were there for two years. They took that on. I know a nurse in Australia, a nurse practitioner, who is uh, the only healthcare person for four months of the year on a little tiny island off the north coast of Australia where the major uh, industry is shrimp fishing. And she goes out with the shrimp fisher persons and their families and she does that for four months of the year and she's the only healthcare person. So she told me, you know, her, I said, what's your scope of practice? <laughs> <laughs> she said she has re had recently taken care of the pilot of the plane that was supposed to fi fly her off this island <laughs> who collapsed with a heart attack as he was loading her suitcase into the back of the plane. She uh, did a lot of getting fish hooks out of people's fingers. She did labor and delivery and delivered babies. She did everything. She was the only healthcare person. And I said, wasn't that kind of lonesome? And she said, no, she had a, a phone connection to somebody back at the base hospital. And 
it was, she was too busy anyway, and it was way too interesting and too much fun. I know, oh, I know so many interesting nurses who do so many interesting things, but this might be the way to wind this up. I know the three nurses who took care of my mother at home. They were a CNA, an LPN, and an RN. And they kept her laughing to the extent she had any breath to laugh. And they kept she and my father functioning until they no longer could simply do that. And they were absolutely magnificent to me when I needed to be called and to fly immediately across the country to take care of them. I have one final question. It's my question. Um, as I listened, your answers have been so eloquent. But while you talked about why nursing, why write about nursing, and an unbelievably rich career, you never mentioned why you got so interested in data and mining the data. What drove you there? Well, um, when I uh, ended the, the deanship at Yale, after 12 and a half years, uh, I was offered the opportunity to work with the DRG guys, the guys who invented DRGs at Yale, uh, through John Thompson, who was a professor in the School of Public Health and, and who was a nurse, and through those two um, hats, I, whom I, I knew. And he invited me onto the research team, which was then doing what became the last of the studies that were done here. And it was about, could we use available administrative data to weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, weight DRGs by measures of nursing intensity? And I, I was thinking about this the other day when I was thinking about what you might ask me. Um, and I think the reason John uh, asked me to join the club, as it were, is because by then I knew a lot of the people in Washington, and I think he thought I could be the spokesperson for this effort, which, you know, a lot of people never knew that John was a nurse, so they thought that all this DRG nonsense was done by, you know, them, operations researchers, and it really wasn't. And so I joined the team and talked about it learning curve. Uh, it was really, really, truly a learning curve. But when I got to see the data that they were working with and got to understand how the data got in there and got to understand what the data were, it was a cause, man. Because nobody to this day, nobody hardly except you around here, and I'm serious about that, know what's in the data and how it can speak to nursing. I have these conversations all the time. I just had a conversation with somebody who's a uh, a nurse at Mass at uh, Partners who was trying to do something with her unit's uh, information to try to figure out how they can be a little better. And she had no idea what was in her data set, even though she fills out the information forms every bloody day. And so I got really intrigued with that. And then um, along about the same time, I met Steve Allegretto who is an amazing person. He was a student of mine in the School of Public Health. He likes to tell the story about how I flunked him on one of his <laughs> early papers, and it's true, it was not a good paper. <laughs> um, but he pinned me down after class one time and said, you know, we really need to capture nursing at Yellow Haven in a way that we haven't before, and by then I was deep enough into this project that I knew about waiting DRGs, and would you like to talk with me a little bit more about um, how we could maybe do that. And I said, sure, and so we had another conversation. He hired me <laughs> on the spot, like without references or anything. <laughs> and then I had the brilliance to hire Janice Bozzo, who was a student of mine in the School of Nursing and whose career was headed in a whole other direction. <laughs> and we together conducted a great enormous study with a, a committee of <clears throat> people that Sue had appointed, and we waited DRGs by expert estimates of nursing care requirements. And it was tedious as hell, but it was really a lot of fun. 
because those nurses got to understand what was inside the data too, and it started to spread. And, and God knows Janice and I got to understand the difference among nursing units, how nursing units differ from one another in case mix, but also in all kinds of other ways. And I got very intrigued with the notion that Sue was then talking about, about uh, nurse managers being the CEOs of their unit. Every nursing unit is a business. It's a little bitty or bigger business, depending on what it is. And it must be managed not only as a business, but as a production. We produce patient care, and we need to have that recognized in the systems that monitor us, including the financial systems. And I learned a whole lot from uh, Steve and from Charlie here, uh, who were part of the early days of what we called RIMS then, um, and I guess you still call it RIMS, uh, which is all about using the, the Yale New Haven's existing clinical, operational, and financial uh, uh, data to make decisions. And that sounds like such a simple proposition. Let's use some data. Well, it isn't. And the development that you guys have done here uh, is just phenomenal across the country um, in actually using data to make planning decisions, to make quality decisions, to make hiring decisions, particularly of physicians, to uh, redistribute beds around, and what I fell in love with the most was to understand nursing units. I think nursing units are so interesting because there's so much going on all the time and it's all balls in the air. And the nurses have to figure out how to do that, not only so that nobody dies, but so that people are happy working there and so that patients get out of the hospital as soon as possible. And, um, so that's how I sort of fell into data. And then once in it, couldn't possibly leave it because <laughs> it was just so much fun. Thank you, Donna. I think that influence today is still enormously felt. And while you talked about, you know, what data does, one thing you left out was, you know, the ability, your work gave us language to secure resources in a resource-strapped environment. And I cannot tell you how powerful that has been um, because Donna was able to give us the structure to prove not only the influence of volume on a unit, but the complexity of the patients and, and how that then yielded in a mathematical type of way um, the need for nursing resources, inclusive of leadership resources as well as at the caregiver level. So your influence will be felt, is felt, and will be felt for, for many, many, many years to come. And I think for those of you that don't know Donna well, doesn't know maybe the work that you have done, um, you feel that influence, I can tell you, every day because she gave us the ability to articulate what that looks like in a way that Steve Allegretto, who has an unending draw of FTEs, I knew it, I knew when you said he hired you on the spot, he's got some draw of FTEs, I'm going back and finding them. <laughs> but how powerful that language is when you have to compete for resources. So your impact will be felt for many, 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 many years. It's a true legacy that I think you have left, so I thank you very much. So we do have microphones strategically placed, and hopefully some of you will take this opportunity to ask Donna um, some questions. Hi, Donna. My name is Judy Hahn, and I work with a lot of nursing students and a lot of nurses um, 
who are struggling to write. And um, I thought maybe with your years of experience as a faculty member and a writer yourself, if you could offer us any um, suggestions uh, as far as how to encourage people to get that confidence to have their voice heard and become writers. I don't mean this comment to be flip altogether, but it is the essence of it. Paul Simon has a song in which one of the lines is, want to be a writer, don't know where or when, find a quiet place and grab a humble pen. <laughs> <laughs> but you first got to have an idea. <laughs> and that converting an idea into something that might be written, whether it ever ends up being published or not, is harder than you think. I agonize for the first 20 minutes of a speech I have to write or an article I have to start because it just won't, and um, it still happens. I had to do something last week and I thought, oh, I'm old now, can I get over this? No, you don't get over it. The trick is to figure out two things. One is, who's your audience? Who do you want to convince? Or whose ideas do you want to change? Or whatever, who, who's your audience? And the other is, what's your story? What is this about? What is this article about? And that, I, Margaret can surely attest that that happens for experienced researchers as well. How do we want to frame this so that it affects whatever it is that you, you want to affect? Um, from there on, it's those two things on, it's a matter of, uh, I think, personal style. Uh, some people uh, just sit down and write and then throw out the pieces of paper when it's not going where you want it to go. I can't bear throwing away my own work. <laughs> um, some people want to talk it out with somebody, and that's always a good strategy. Um, some people write it out as fast and furiously as they can and then put it in a box somewhere and sit on it for six weeks and then come back and see whether it still makes sense. Um, some people take a writing course, I mean a creative writing course, not just any old writing course, but a creative writing course. Because the people who do that have all kind of tricks for you know, how to get started, how to keep going, how to develop the thoughts, how to develop the characters if you're writing fiction, whatever. Um, it's, it's harder than it looks, but it's also easier than it looks because after the first 20 minutes, you're on a roll. Hi, my name is Heather. I'm a service line educator in medicine. When you talk about operations management on the units, that's exactly what happens. I'm sure everyone agrees. Um, and I never really thought about it before you mentioned it today, but it's not something that's taught in undergraduate education, and I think that it's definitely something that nursing students should be exposed to. So do you think there's a way that we could get that into the curriculum somehow? Well, sure. I've done any number of presentations at Quinnipiac in the undergraduate curriculum. I don't know that that's the place to put it, because undergraduates are so scared and they've got so much to learn and cram in their heads and they get moved every six weeks from somewhere to somewhere else. I think maybe if you had a final year kind of a capstone seminar, free discussion thing, you could probably do something interesting with the operations management content. Um, we teach it at YSN in the Nursing Management Policy and Leadership course and we will teach it in the DNP as well. And I need to put in a plug for those two programs, which we are recruiting for <laughs> as we speak. Um, the content itself is not hard, and nurses understand it in their bones. I mean, because you have to live with it every day. You just need a language, as Sue talked about. You need a language for how to talk about that. Um, and it's, it's actually not very hard, um, and there are theories out there, theories in operations management, theories in organizational behavior, theories in organizational diagnosis that are just incredibly powerful um, and, and terrifically useful if you know there's theories out there and if you know how to put them into uh, helping to understand your working environment life. 
Donna, Francine, hi. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a question um, as far as, and I wanted to thank you publicly because you have done a lot for us here at Yale New Haven, I will say that, and Sue has summarized, helping us talk to Steve and Charlie has been um, <laughs> Uh, an exciting endeavor um, and trying to get people to understand operations. But one of the things you had mentioned in uh, your book was around that nursing is not an oppressed group, um, but the rest of the world hasn't caught up. How do you think about that now? I mean, do you think the world is catching up? Because I still think there's that oppression that sometimes you hear from nurses. Ah, oh, but that's the distinction, Francine. You don't hear it from the outside world. They have no idea whether we're oppressed or not, and they don't care. We think of ourselves as oppressed, and we're not. And, and we need to simply get over behaving like that. Now, we're getting way better at that, way better at that. The public media are not particularly getting better, but there are serious efforts being mounted, uh, the most serious of which that I know is at UCLA, where Courtney Leiter, who's the dean there, has orchestrated now two national conferences on nursing in the media, involving the media, not just ourselves saying, oh, ain't it awful how they portray us. Um, involving the media and involving people who analyze the media. There, one of the conferences, the first one, is published in na, 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 a special issue of Nursing Outlook. And I recommend it to anybody. It's uh, like the September, October issue of Nursing Outlook as a special supplement. I recommend everybody read it because it lifted me completely off my chair when I was reading it at home at my dining room table. It's full of insight about why we might feel oppressed by, by the media and it's full of activities that people have done to improve things. Did you know, for example, that the American Medical Association had a contract for a very long time that they had script approval for Dr. Kildare and Ben Casey? No wonder they came out the way they did. <laughs> and there's still some of that going on, although it's a whole lot less. Uh, the AMA has kind of lost some speed. Um, there, there's still some of that going on with House and, and uh, the other programs. I don't even know their names. I don't watch them. Um, what is distinctive about what this guy who analyzes this stuff says is distinctive about Nurse Jackie is that its origins aren't in the previous nurse shows and China Beach and uh, all of the ones that came before. Their origins are in The Sopranos. <laughs> because Edie Falco played yeah. Mrs. Soprano. And so that, that, the tone of Nurse Jackie is straight out of The Sopranos. And it, it sort of helps to understand that. <laughs> and maybe to say that you know, they portray her, her social life and her family life as kind of dysfunctional but they portray her nursing life as right on target. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Heslin. I'm a new nurse here at Yale New Haven Hospital and actually a new nurse. Raise your hand or something. I can't tell where you are there. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm feeling at Yale New Haven as if we are in an era where we are in the business of providing care. Um, and I came from a business background. I'm wondering how you feel about that within the nursing school. Uh, certainly the one to which I went did not provide that kind of background um, or education. What do you think? I'm not sure I get the point of your question. Are you, are you saying we should teach business in nursing we schools so that people will service. realize what they're going into? Yes, we should teach customers. Well, it would be the same response to the, the other woman uh, who wants us to teach operations management. There's no room in the curriculum. Because for undergraduate students, now for master's programs, absolutely we should be doing it, and surely for DNP programs. But for undergraduate programs, they're not there, those students. Tell me if I'm wrong. 
I just don't think they can comprehend that. They're having so much stuffed in their heads about how to not only do the clinical work, but manage to survive on the unit with all the complexities that go on on a unit. I, I just don't think they're there. Let me ask her, before you uh, leave her, Ellen, um, have you found your business uh, background helpful to you as a new nurse? I don't have a good answer other than the one I've just just given. Perhaps, well, I'm making this up on the spot, but uh, Northeastern University used to have, and I'm not sure they still do, perhaps there's someone in the audience who knows, Northeastern used to have this really wonderful undergraduate nursing program where students did either six months or a year of basic nursing education, and then they went to work with no seminars or anything uh, for a period of time. I don't remember how long it was. And then they went back and did more nursing, and then they went to work. And it would be in those going to work times where you could accomplish, and, and the curriculum was five, five years long. Um, it would be in those work periods where I think you could do some interesting stuff with business and with um, business concepts and with operations research operations concepts. I saw her hang the microphone to you, so I know where you are. Hi, Donna. I'm, uh, uh, I'm Yan Fan, who is a registered nurse in China. I have a question that, do you think uh, whether the nurse manager should, should have a nursing background with a plenty of clinical nursing experience? Uh, let me make sure I understood your question. Whether the nurse manager should be a nurse? Uh, yes, and uh, with uh, plenty of clinical nursing uh, experience. Uh, yes, would be the short answer. Uh, the business is nursing. The business we're in is nursing. And much as I love my interdisciplinary colleagues, they don't uh, get it get it in the depth you need to manage it. Now, I will tell you an international story uh, that will, I hope, provide some evidence for that. In the mid-1990s, Barbara? Where are you, Barbara? Yes. Um, New Zealand went through absolutely punishing health reforms in order to shore up their um, the, uh, economics of the country, which had fallen on very bad times. And one of the strategies they used to accomplish this uh, magnificent effort was what they called managerialism, which is, comes out of the University of Chicago and is a theory that says that any manager can manage anything. And so they removed the head nurse positions and all senior positions over the head nurse positions from all hospitals. Furthermore, they did it on a Friday and dismissed these people with a, they don't do pink slips, they do brown slips, but the brown slips and the people came back and they came back, the nurses who were not dismissed came back on the Monday and discovered that the new manager who could have come from telecommunications, he could have come from the brewing, brewer, uh, brewery industry um, he could have come from anywhere, but not, he was not a nurse, and he wasn't a doctor either, which would have been maybe better, but no, not much. Um, discovered that his first task was putting together a schedule because a nursing unit doesn't close down at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And it was complete chaos until somebody, t because all the nurse managers had gone, they'd gone away. There wasn't anybody to tell him what to do. 
So he suddenly had to learn very fast that uh, you have to develop a 24-hour schedule. It's a 24-hour business. Those people lasted about six months and they began to fill them back in with nurses. Meanwhile, the nurses, the nursing leadership in New Zealand was decimated. Many people migrated, emigrated um, uh, permanently to Australia and it has left the New Zealand healthcare delivery system in the most terrible situation. Uh, Barbara McCluskey, who's sitting next to Janice, has uh, done a couple of studies where we have looked at data, existing data, not to the nursing unit level, but to the hospital level, and demonstrated that where nursing resources are cut, measures of, patient, of negative patient outcomes go up. We've published them twice. They've been circulated widely in New Zealand. Uh, one of our co-authors, who is a New Zealand professor of nursing, has done a, a podcast for their local radio, and nobody pays any attention. Why? Because nursing is not a revenue center. Nursing doesn't bring any money into the hospital. Well, what is the hospital for? if not for nursing. You could do surgery on the kitchen table if you felt like it. You, know, you can clearly do psychiatric stuff in an office. You can take people's blood pressures and you can administer IVs at home. What do you need a hospital for? For nursing, 24 hour nursing. Now, how do we turn nursing into a revenue center? You don't want me to do that lecture, even though it's not very long, because it's a piece of cake. You just have to get your finance department to understand how to do it. Sorry, I have a, uh, one more question. If you are director of hospital, which one uh, would you prefer to choose to, the, to be the nursing manager? One is a younger nurse with a high level of background and have done, has done a lot of uh, research. And another one is an older nurse who, uh, who is uh, ha who has a plenty full of clinical nursing experience? Well, I'd like to take the best of both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's an unanswerable question, actually, because you want an, someone who understands business, who understands operations, stuff like that, and that may well be a younger person just because of the age we're in. Um, and you want someone who really understands the work in his or her bones. And if you can stick them together, you got your candidate. Okay. I was just going to make a comment right here. <laughs> Hello. Okay. I just wanted to make a comment before uh, you had that uh, mentioned about Northeastern University. I went to Drexel University, and we also had a similar program where we went um, a total of 18 month of work experience. Um, it was a five year program, and. Um, I do agree that like having a business perspective would might benefit as well as understanding the operational systems. I know I had taken the leadership course, um, and I'm not really sure what I learned in that course, but maybe they can incorporate those two subjects in that um, course. But I just wanted to say that having had that five years experience is, I think, useful in my education, knowing where I want to go with my nursing career. So, Thank you for that. We have time for like one more question. Whatever you want. Hi, John. It's Carrie Gutman. Hey, patient. Carrie. Hi. How are you? So great to see you. Um, I'm patient safety coordinator in the Department of Medicine. I'm thrilled to hear you say that safety and quality is where it's at in research. So we've got to get cracking and do some writing on that, I guess. Um, my question is about interdisciplinary education. Can you talk? a little bit about the opportunities for physicians and nurses and pharmacists, occupational therapists, all of us to start to learn together to foster interdisciplinary work that we do in the clinical setting? Um, well, this is gonna be a fairly uninformed opinion because I haven't given this one a lot of thought, but I, uh, surely we ought to have people who are gonna be caring for the same patients together in the same room long before they hit their first patient. Uh, partly to understand each other's discipline and what each, what sh what each discipline uh, brings to the table. 
uh, and but, and here's the big but, um, until our own mindset changes and the mindset of uh, medical education and the mindset of pharmacy education and whoever else we want to throw in the pot, until all of those change, and by mindset, I don't mean the content, the, you know, anatomy, physiology, what's it, what's it, what's it, what's it. It's what you do with the content. And so long as there is still a notion that healthcare is mainly medicine, I don't think the hopes for interdisciplinary education are really terribly well founded. Now, as you know, there um, is a lot of focus on interdisciplinary education by funding agencies and foundations and so on, and I will be interested to read what uh, those reports say when they've evaluated whatever their projects were. Because I'm, I'm really, really kind of cautious about thinking that that's going to solve the world's problems. I really don't think so. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Can I ask a follow-up question? Follow -up question? So you talked about mindset. So how is it, I'm a very rubber hits the road, like, let's get moving, let's do something. How do you change people's mindsets? It's panel discussions, it's writing, it's advocacy. What, do you have any ideas about that? Well, I don't know that you can do it while they're students. See, that's the tricky bit. It's like the response to the, the uh, people over here about can you teach business and operations at the undergraduate level, and you heard what I said about that. I'm not sure you can teach that kind of interdisciplinary collaboration at the medical student level. Now, see, we've got this funny thing in healthcare education where we educate our young at the baccalaureate level. They educate their young at what is essentially the master's level, only they call it a doctor. Pharmacy is, has now moved in that direction as well. And simply the difference in the age of physician undergraduate students, which is where you'd want to start planting the seeds, uh, and those in the other disciplines is uh, a handicap, I think, because like nursing students who have to stuff all this stuff in their heads while they're learning not to kill somebody. Medical students are under an even more punishing schedule. You know what a, a medical school curriculum looks like? It's really punishing. And they get it in little tiny drops, like they get a week on this and a week on that and a week on that, and maybe a couple of observations in, in the middle. And that's not conducive to thinking about the patient that's behind the symptom or the colleagues that you might need to deal with to help the patient get to where the patient needs to go. I, I just think there's a naivete about pushing interdisciplinary education without thinking, you know, how old are the students going to be? Um, how punishing is the curriculum going to be? You know, how can we stick this in somewhere? Now, there's some stuff that I think you can teach, and we're doing it too, anatomy, for example. There's not a whole lot of difference between what nursing students need to know about that and what medical students need to know about that. And it might even be a good place to start, and, and so we're doing that. When you start getting to other um, uh, areas, I don't know about. Is that okay, Carrie? I, I appreciate your insight. Uh, I guess we're talking about a cultural change that's way beyond the classroom. Uh, so we will continue this adventure. Thank you. I want to thank Donna. I think this was fabulous. Thank you, Donna. My pleasure. At this time, we are going to award the first ever Donna Deers Speaking of Nursing Awards. So it is with great joy that I am here with Donna, who is my mentor, to 
talk about these awards that were created based on her book, Speaking of Nursing. The purpose of this award is to provide a forum for nurses with a passion for the profession to use narratives or data as a means of demonstrating how their practice aligns with Donna's definition of nursing and makes nursing visible locally, regionally, and nationally. Nurses at all levels were eligible. This year, all recipients were nominated in the category of data, nursing, and hospital operations. The criteria included demonstration of the use of data by nurses that improves hospital operations and or processes of care, resulting in positive outcomes for patients, staff, the hospital, the nursing profession, health policy, in alignment with Donna's definition, which is, nursing is two things, the care of the sick or the potentially sick, and the tending of the entire environment in which care happens. With that, we would like to move to the presentation of the awards. I will announce the committee selections with a very brief outline of the rationale or project and ask that the recipients join us on stage as I call your name. This year, we are pleased to present three outstanding individuals with a Donna Deere Speaking of Nursing Award. They are Diane Collins. Diane created the Data Driven Quality and Safety Programs in the Heart and Vascular Service Line, most recently using real-time data to reduce LVAD driveline infections. Diane is passionate about data driving safer practice. Lori Hubbard. Lori, through the YNHH Magnet Journey, integrated data into the direct care setting. To quote a Yale New Haven Magnet ambassador, Lori's proficiency was apparent to all who participated in the overwhelming magnet process. Teresa Highland utilized data in the women's and children's service line to obtain specialized assistance for newborn emergencies. Teresa analyzed data regarding emergency call records and standardized the nomenclature for the emergency response in neonatal intensive care. If the awardees could join us on stage, and all of you join me in congratulating this year's Donna Deere Speaking of Nursing Awardees. And all of the awardees are going to receive a copy of Speaking of Nursing, which is the book that we discussed today. We are going to have um, refreshments upstairs, and I would like you all to take that opportunity to talk to the award recipients about their work. Thank you.